Hello to everyone. I thank you everyone who joined us in this difficult time. In my opinion, it's great that we find time to explore the uh, experience of human uh, reconstruction and think about our future. Together we are strong. Uh, the organizer of this event is the School of Construction Man uh, Project Management Pro-PM, which in peacetime a uh, train manager and specialized in the construction field and improve the uh, qualifications of project management. Uh, the mission of the school is to change the culture of construction in Ukraine. Uh, my name is Vladislav Fitsa. I am a young Ukrainian architect. I uh, received uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in Kyiv National University of Construction and Architecture. And now um, one of the fields of my activity is to study the experience of urban reconstruction. Uh, the timing of our event is about one hour with a half. Uh, 40 50 minutes for the lecture and uh, 50 30 minutes uh, for the section of questions uh, questions and answers uh, our guest is Semen Shiroshin uh, Semen is a researcher of the history of Kiev architecture uh, Semen wrote a lot of books about uh, Kiev architecture including the reconstruction of Kiev after the World War II and reconstruction of Khrushchev uh, also, Simon is an active defender of Kyiv historical monuments and carry out educational activities of uh, our uh, Kyiv architecture. So, thank you, Simon, that you found time to show us the case of reconstruction of Kyiv. Uh, so, let me pass word to you and let's begin your lecture. Thanks, Ladislav. Uh, it's interesting that. Uh, uh, this series of lectures that are happening uh, are telling us uh, uh, stories of different cities that uh, were rebuilt after the Second World War and sometimes before the Second World War. And it's, it's interesting that uh, this experience is different. Somewhere uh, uh, the process was focused on uh, improving existing uh, uh, roads uh, and uh, living residential areas. Somewhere it was focused on reconstructing the previous phase of the city. Somewhere it was a search of something new. And uh, it is interesting for us to know uh, the stories of other cities. And I also think that is a, a good chance to show uh, our own story. But it's good to know our own story. Uh, by ourselves, because uh, sometimes uh, it is not uh, uh, always when architect knows the history of uh, architecture of exact city where he is working and where he is living. So um, let us start the history of rebuilding Kiev uh, since 30s and till the reconstruction after the Second World War. Uh, so. Uh, let me show my screen so you can see what's happening. OK, so this is the first image. It is 1935. This is the time when the master plan of Kyiv was developed. One of the most important events that happened uh, before the Second World War is the development of uh, this uh, master plan. In 1934, the uh, Soviet government was moved from Kharkiv to Kyiv. And now people like to underestimate the meaning of this event because they think that uh, nothing has changed because uh, anyway, all the decisions were made in Moscow and the uh, capital was somehow uh, uh, a fake thing here. But in fact, from side of urban development, this event was uh, the most important that happened uh, to Kyiv at the time. So uh, what was the city before that? It was a province, it was a peripheral city uh, with uh, a, a lack of uh, finance uh, because uh, the Kharkiv was the capital of Bolshevik Ukraine and this meant that he had uh, more money. 
when capital was moved to Kyiv, the city budget was changed and the uh, budget for capital construction uh, was multiplied about uh, four times. So this is one of the interesting uh, things that I found when I wrote a book about uh, the um, moving capital and uh, how the capital was uh, rebuilt in 30s and uh, how the government center was uh, built and so on. So what's interesting? The budget is growing four times, so we need to find what to do. A lot of things need to be done because uh, capital needs a lot of administrative buildings, more residential buildings and so on. So uh, the most uh, important is to analyze the current city problems that were at the moment. So uh, the architects that uh, made the master plan of 1935 uh, first analyzed what were the most important problems. Now we see the map and you see how city looked like in 1935. So we have the river in the center and we have the left bank. It is shown on the right because the river is going from up to down. So on the right we have the left bank where you see now only some villages. So the city will appear there only uh, after it uh, was designed that this part must be part of the city. Previously, Kiev was on only on the right bank because the left bank is lower and it comes under the water. It came under the water each spring previously. But we see also the railroad. Railroad is uh, uh, surrounding Kiev and it, is, uh, it was one of the problems of city development because uh, it, uh, I remember about five or six places where uh, road traffic could cross the railroad. And this was some kind of limitation for growing the city, and also it was a problem for connection. Also, uh, all the city transport uh, went to the city center, and uh, there were no uh, highways, there were no avenues that connected the city peripheries between each other. So all of these problems uh, were uh, analyzed, and they were uh, their solution was. Uh, Laid in the city master plan. So, a lot, uh, a little about these problems in uh, details. So, uh, as the city that was grown in the capitalism, we had high density of population in the center, and uh, we had the high density of construction in the center. Because how it worked, uh, you get some money, you buy some piece of land, you buy, uh, you construct. There, you build some building there and you give them for rent. So you need uh, the uh, maximum uh, possible square to give it for rent to get as more money as you can. So the idea is the greed for money. And uh, that's why if uh, the capitalist city had very uh, high density. In some quarters, it was about 50% of total square that was given for construction. In some, it was even 70% of quarter square that was uh, given for construction. And uh, this meant that uh, if we have such density of population, uh, such density of construction, it means that uh, we have uh, less uh, air circulation, we have problems with um, insulation, and uh, it is bad for the uh, sanitary uh, needs. And also, Kyiv wasn't green, so this is one of the problem of low greenery. Now we have the stereotype that Kyiv is the city inside the forest. In fact, this is a result of a big work that started since the master plan was approved, because uh, all the parks, all the trees that were planted on hills are a result of somebody's work. Uh, this was not happening at the time before the Second World War. If you look at all pictures of Kyiv city, you cannot find so many trees as you can see here now. So this is also one of the problems. So we speak about this high density population and uh, this, is, uh, uh, this also was one of the problems. The next one was that uh, industry was uh, near densely populated areas. So uh, about, um, as I remember, about 20% um, of uh, population lived in the distance of less than 500 meters to some big industrial object. So, of course, this was not uh, good 
for their health. And the idea was to move such industrial enterprises from densely populated areas. This was one of the ideas of the master plan. Uh, also, the idea was to uh, somehow uh, decrease the density of population in the city centre because uh, you had some territory where you had a building, after the building you had another one and another one, and uh, this, this all was very uh, densely built and populated. But this problem was not so easy to solve because the city was growing. And the problem is that uh, new industry that was built under uh, Soviet uh, time, uh, it required more people to work there. And it happened that the um, time uh, to uh, time to build new buildings was uh, uh, somehow it took more time to build new residential buildings than uh, it uh, took to build uh, industrial new industrial objects. So industrial objects were uh, more important for the government than residential uh, housing. So it happened that uh, a lot of residential buildings were built in the city, but the population was growing faster and the average square meter was going down and down. So the city was growing, the city was developing. So this is one of the uh, issues of 1930s. Uh, also, one of the problems was the difference in uh, uh, some public services. When in the center we had the water, we had the uh, street, city street lights, we had sewage, we had the, um, all the things that we consider normal part of the city. But there on the peripheries there was no road surface, no uh, pavements, no water, no street lights, etc. It was you know, like a village of the 19th century. So this was uh, one of the problems that uh, Master Plan uh, suggested to solve. Also, the problem of low throughput of streets and avenues. So, uh, uh, architects understood that cars were more and more important. And though in, at that time no private cars were allowed, architects understood that there would be more and more traffic. Some public transport, some uh, cargo, and they understood that private transport will appear. And it will take uh, more and more it will need more and more uh, throughput of the roads and any. So this was another important uh, uh, decision to widen some streets, uh, avenues, uh, to have more throughput. This was some investment in the future. Uh, and uh, as I already said, the traffic limitations because of railroads. This is one of the problems uh, that uh, even the north part of city wasn't considered to be uh, good enough to be built because the railroad was the limitation. And there were only few places where it could be crossed. Uh, so uh, important thing, this is the master plan of 1935. You see that the left bank uh, first has some regular um, areas of residential housing and industry. And we see that the city is growing to different directions, to the south, to the west, uh, new housing areas appear, uh, new roads appear, some roads became, become avenues, and uh, this is the first time when uh, new avenues that connect different city peripheries appear. So this master plan was the most important master plan that were designed, I think, in 20th century in Kiev, because it was a revolutionary one. And uh, the next one, yeah, that was in 1947, it happened after, just right after the war. It was uh, repeating many uh, ideas that were in uh, Master Plan of 1935. So the problem was that uh, by the start of the war, most of uh, the ideas of Master Plan of 1935 were not complete because they were very ambitious to create many new roads, to build many new places and so on. Uh, what's interesting uh, is uh, that here you can see a few circles in western part of the city. So these circles are airports. So it was the idea that at that time uh, that it, it is good for the airfield to be a circle, not a line, because when it's a circle, you can fly uh, against the wind uh, in any direction. So it was the idea. Um, and uh, here you see uh, most of the uh, streets that 
will appear later. Some of them will appear in another way. Some of them won't appear, but the uh, avenues that connect city peripheries were first designed here, and they were uh, built up. Some of them were built after the war. Many of them will be built after the war. But the idea of uh, rebuilding city, of improving uh, it and uh, to solving some city problems that were mentioned before, this always happened in this master plan. So it is a very important docu document that is showing us uh, how the city was thought to be developed at that time. And what is important, the avenues that what I was saying before. Uh, on this map, we see uh, the red lines, the main avenues that were designed to appear at that time. Uh, and uh, if you compare this to modern map, of Kyiv city, you can see that most of them exist exactly in the way they were designed at that moment. Some of them don't, just a few, but most of them exist. And this means that uh, idea of creating these avenues and widening the streets and connecting uh, peripheries with each other was a very important idea and uh, it was realized after the war. Of course, a few words about the architecture, because the uh, 1930s to the time of Stalinist architecture, it means that uh, cities must have a new look, they must be beautiful, and they, the idea was to inspire Soviet architecture by the um, architectural heritage of the world, first of all, the classic architecture. So that's why the architecture of 1930s, 40s, and 50s is called the uh, Stalinist classicism, and uh, that's why we see uh, the, this inspiration from classic architecture. But honestly, not only the classic one, because on this square, um, I see the tower in the right, uh, the right place. Uh, this tower looks uh, like a minaret of uh, uh, Northern Africa or towers um, of Spain. And uh, this is also world heritage. So uh, Soviet architects inspired not only from uh, antique architecture, not only from a uh, Renaissance, not only from neoclassicism of um, uh, different periods, but they inspired from some uh, historical architectural styles. So this is a very important <laughs> and interesting thing. So this is the square, the vision of the square that was not made <laughs> this way. It wasn't realized. It's the uh, currently, it's the Lviska Square, uh, and uh, almost nothing from this vision was done. So, if, if you don't know what square it is, you cannot even see uh, and uh, you cannot understand where it is. This is the um, Victory Square in Kiev, and the idea was to widen the avenue, and the avenue was widened. And the idea was to have two towers that start this avenue, and um, those towers appeared only in the end of 50s, and they were um, not that high. But the idea to make the square as a single ensemble. So this was a total idea of Stalinist architecture, and we can see it as in a master plan, as in future in construction of Reshetik, that I will show uh, some slides later. And also the left back. So we first see uh, for the first time in this uh, master plan, we see that left bank becomes part of the city. Uh, previously, it wasn't even part of the Kyiv region, it was uh, part of Chernigiv region, because the left bank was considered something, something different. But uh, after the bridges were built, and it was understood that uh, Kyiv must grow to the left bank, and uh, this was the first project of some urban development here. There was, what's the difference? The right bank is high, we have hills, and that's why streets have some different directions, not always straight ones. Here on the left bank is this uh, flat, and that's why here is, uh, that the structure of the streets is more regular, as on the project, as in reality, because uh, relief is not a problem. After that, the war. The war is very important. Uh, point in this lecture, and uh, what is the most important, uh, how, how it went on. In 1941, uh, Germans took Kyiv, 
1933, they left Kiev. Uh, there were no street fights, so just the army left the city, and in some time, the opponent army took the city. So this is why the city was not uh, completely damaged. But there were uh, bombardments, uh, and the industry was bombed. Uh, when Soviet army left the city, uh, the bridges were blown up. The same happened when Germans left the city. Uh, also, uh, so the bridges were destroyed. Industry was uh, mostly destroyed. Uh, in 1943, when Germans uh, were preparing to defend the city from Soviet attacks, they completely destroyed uh, everything that was on the left bank. And the same thing happened not only in Kiev. It is a luck for the city that Kiev is on the right bank of Dnieper. And uh, cities like Kremenchuk that um, were built on the left bank of Dnieper suffered more because that city was destroyed by 97%. In 1943, Germans destroyed almost everything there before they left. Uh, and uh, But the most famous is that Kiev um, suffered damages in the city center. Uh, 324 buildings were burned and destroyed in central quarters. Uh, the reasons were the fires and the demolition uh, because some of them were mined and then blown up uh, by partisans as it's still. But honestly, we don't know the whole story. We don't know uh, when each building was completely destroyed. So we have only a picture, some pictures before the war, some pictures uh, during the war and um, I tried to calculate uh, the time of damage uh, for each building, and it's uh, not an easy task. But what is uh, important, this number, 324 buildings, is often used as a number of buildings that were totally lost. This is wrong, because of this uh, number, uh, about 200 were rebuilt, and this is another interesting part of the story. Uh, what happened to the city housing? Uh, 39 percent of Hazen Square was lost or damaged, so it meant that people couldn't live there. But at the time, city lost about 80 percent of population uh, because uh, many people were evacuated. Some of them uh, joined the army and left the city, and uh, many people were killed. So this means that um, the city reached its uh, pre-war number of uh, population only in the end of 50s. So it took about 15 years to bring back that number of people that lived in, in the city before the war. It was almost almost a million before, and about 200,000 after um, the city was taken back in 1943. So uh, some pictures from the time. So these are the damaged buildings, uh, the picture of 1941. You see that uh, most of them suffered fires, and uh, they have only uh, walls, so there are no uh, roofs, there are no ceilings, everything is burned. So these buildings cannot be used at the moment, but can they be rebuilt or not? This is a good question. So these buildings that you see, most of them were rebuilt. And these buildings that you see were not rebuilt. But as you can see, the difference in their uh, in the way the, they look uh, is not so so big. It means that um, the buildings uh, that were destroyed and the buildings that were rebuilt were in the same conditions. So this is another picture of the buildings. These buildings, some of them also were um, dismantled in 1944, 1945, and we'll bring back. Let's talk about. Uh, rebuilding uh, those uh, buildings that were damaged during the war. It's a uh, very interesting story that uh, for most time, I think, was somehow behind the scenes because um, we didn't analyze which buildings uh, that existed before the war, which of them just uh, had no fire, no suffering and so on. We see that those buildings exist now. We think that they were not damaged. And other buildings uh, that were damaged and were rebuilt look almost the same when we walk around the street. So uh, if we walk around the city today, we cannot feel the difference between the buildings that were rebuilt and the buildings 
that were actually um, that actually didn't suffer the war. So this was very uh, interesting uh, story. So what actually happened? Um, the uh, most of buildings that were damaged but could be rebuilt were rebuilt. This is the position of uh, the main city architect Vlasov. He told that boxes, um, the buildings that had only walls, were called boxes. That each box must be rebuilt if it can be rebuilt, and if it uh, isn't against our future city development plans. This is another point that we need to remember. But uh, most of them were rebuilt because uh, when you have a box, you don't need to um, have so much uh, brick to build something. You have that building, you just need some wood to make the floor, to make the roof, and you need some material, you need less materials to rebuild the building than to build a new one. And uh, so this was done, uh, first of all, not from the some side of respect to the history of architecture, but because of the uh, practical needs. We need to have this building repaired. So it was like some uh, process of uh, bringing them back alive, but it was not a completely restoration. So we cannot say that uh, they carefully rebuilt everything in the way it was. Some of those buildings were improved, and this is uh, another interesting story, because uh, um, this was a prep approach of replanning, because uh, the damage was considered not only as a loss, but it is as an ability to improve. Many houses in city center uh, were built uh, under capitalism and they had big expensive apartments for rent. When uh, uh, communists came, they nationalized those apartments and uh, they placed multiple families in a single apartment and this apartment uh, type was called communal apartment and even now I know some people in Kiev that live in such type of apartments. So many families in one apartment and uh, this caused many inconveniences to the residents because some places were shared, kitchen, bathroom, toilet and you have only some your uh, living rooms for yourself and uh, everybody understood that it is better to have your own small apartment than the part of a big apartment, but communal apartment, the shared one. Uh, so um, the idea was when these buildings were rebuilt, uh, their plan was changed. And instead of big apartments that were used as communal ones, uh, there they were split into smaller ones. So the square was used to get more separate apartments to have this less inconvenience to inhabitants. So this was one of the ideas, how can we use damage to improve something? So, uh, but another idea that was happening at that time is improving not only separate houses, but the big ensemble. And in 1944, a competition of rebuilding Krushatik took place and uh, it was two parts of it. The, uh, the main one was in 1944, 1945 and the second part was in 1946. So what was the idea? The idea was to widen the street by dismantling buildings on more damaged outside. So uh, the outside that had more buildings destroyed, it uh, was chosen to dismantle the buildings that were left there and to make the street much more wider. So the street that we have now is much is much more wider than it was before the war. So it was an idea to use damage as a chance to improve. Um, then um, authors needed to propose some solution for reducing future traffic. That's why many of them uh, suggested uh, some alternate streets for traffic and uh, junctions. So uh, I, I, when uh, I saw uh, the way that Coventry was redesigned with those uh, wide uh, uh, streets that were designed for cars, I remember some solutions that were uh, proposed on this competition. 
and we'll see them. So the idea that cars are important, that's why we need junctions, bridges, and uh, uh, many levels of traffic, uh, because traffic will be a problem sometimes. Now, this is considered to be some very old and wrong uh, strategy, but at that time, uh, cars became in the, the, the central part of uh, urban development in the whole world. Uh, also, the task was to rebuild the city as a single ensemble and uh, propose locations and designs for a list of buildings. So, what uh, was uh, required to be in the street. Theaters, city hall, cinemas, ministries, museums, etc. So it had to be some uh, uh, downtown, some place where people don't live but work. Later it was changed uh, because some of the buildings were redesigned to be a residential one. This was uh, done to um, not make the street look like dead in the night, because when nobody's living there, in the evening, uh, the, some uh, business uh, business quarters are empty and they look dead. I saw this in some European and Asian cities, and it, this looks this way. So there were many ideas, and this was the competition. Um, what was interesting, that uh, best architects took place in this competition, not only Ukrainian ones, but also architects from uh, Moscow, from uh, Leningrad, from uh, from Kiev, from Kharkiv, so mostly from these four cities. Uh, there were more, more than 20 projects that were given to this competition, and there were many interesting ideas. Uh, some authors added something on their own choice, towers, monuments, uh, green boulevards that were later uh, accepted and that were that were approved and that exist now. On Khrushchev we have uh, Green Boulevard on the side. Also, some of them suggested changing street axis and much more. So let's look at their visions. So Vlasov, the main architect of Kiev, uh, he uh, his vision is a big square in the center, the currently Maidan, that uh, was split into two parts. One of the parts was along Khrushchev and another part was on the side and it was somehow collecting the streets. You see that there are many streets there are going from different sides that to the, the center of the circle. Uh, and uh, also his vision was uh, several high-rise buildings, the hotel, and uh, near the river it was the uh, monument, uh, it was a pantheon of, of fallen warriors. So the, in, the idea was that it was 1944, and the military theme was very important, so the idea was to uh, commemorate, uh, commemorate those who died in the war in some grand buildings that would be seen from the river. The most interesting is that I hear something similar now. Uh, maybe to today or yesterday I read that there is some idea to build a cemetery for fallen warriors in the current Russian-Ukrainian war somewhere on the hillside so uh, it would be seen from deeper. So the ideas are the same because the time uh, is uh, similar. And also we see that the street is built uh, uh, on each side. We see buildings along the street and in some places, uh, for example, where some streets cross Grishatic, we see some um, public buildings such as theater and so on. So this is uh, the location that uh, uh, this is a proposal of plus. Uh, this is architect Gelfrich. Uh, his vision is to place the city hall and the theater on the opposite sides of the central square, but this makes the square almost disappear. Uh, another wide place is uh, uh, on the against streets that came to Krushadik. And we see that um, on the right part is where the Shevchenko Boulevard is going to be Sarovsky Square. We see a tower that uh, somehow resembles the uh, towers of city halls or some medieval cities. So the idea was uh, to create some vision of historical city. It is interesting that um, 
it's a unique chance if we think about this from side of the architects. Uh, they had um, their tasks usually were to build a house, to build um, some ensemble, or to build uh, some uh, square. This is the maximum, or to build some center, but of a new city. But uh, they never had a task to build a big street into the in the center of a big city. So this task was unique. And they had a chance to build it not chaotic, uh, but to do it as a single ensemble. So it was really a unique scale that those architects had. And that's why the, this um, picture, these images that I tried to find uh, in many places, they look so um, interesting because you can see and uh, uh, how city could look if this was approved. Exavolotti was uh, in, he's the author of our parliament and he's famous for uh, trying to use baroque architecture Ukrainian baroque architecture uh, in um, the architecture of Kreshati so this all looked like um, 17th or 18th century and uh, this uh, work is very interesting also Architect Goltz, uh, his vision was, as we see, he liked Italy and he liked Italian Baroque and so on. So uh, his vision was to build some uh, Renaissance or Baroque uh, Italy on the central street of Ukraine. But he was criticized for uh, using some wrong historical uh, directions because uh, this is not Italy, you know, and uh, this was the reason of some criticism to his works. And, and this is one of the last uh, his works and last competitions because architect Goals died just uh, two years after this. Um, architect Tassi made a very interesting approach because his idea was to change the street access. Uh, if you look at Kreshatik, you see that the start of Kreshatik uh, is not from the hill, but from the hillside. So you cannot have some uh, high rise building or monument there on the hillside. But if you move the street so it ends up in the hill, then you can have some monument on the hill. This is, was the idea of Tetsi. So here on the right, you see there are buildings. And on the second line, there are buildings that actually exist in Kreshatik that um, didn't, uh, that weren't damaged in the war. So his idea was to turn street a little to the right, so it would end up to the, uh, at hill, and there we could see some monument. Monument that uh, most of monuments that are here on this place are the paintings of fallen heroes of the war. And another his idea was to use the hillside. Uh, as a part of ensemble. So not to build buildings just one by one as a corridor, but to use the hillside uh, and to make those stairs, monumental um, arches and so on. And here is uh, his vision. And this idea was used later. If you look at the odd side of Kreshatik, you see that buildings um, have different uh, uh, they stand at a different distance from the street and some of them stand on hill, they stand higher. So this idea was used later. This is important because not all of ideas that were suggested were used. This idea was used. Um, also, uh, three architects from Kharkiv that um, made such a project uh, and you see that in the city center they have some administrative buildings, the Panther on this uh, that's uh, on the side of Dnieper. And what is interesting, but not seen on this project, is that they wanted to make a special order, uh, not the Corinth order, but um, to modify uh, Corinth order to make a special order that would be used on this street and that will become some marker of the street and that will be recognizable and that will be some specific uh, landmark uh, for the city. 
the new order. So, so new order system that they wanted to use here. Um, architect Levinson and his group of architects uh, were uh, uh, also taking part in this competition, but they work it in Leningrad, so they didn't see the Kiev uh, relief. So as you know, Kiev is on the hills, and this uh, image is showing us like a flat city, like there is none of this <laughs> relief that we have. So as you see, it's important to understand not only the plans, but how the city exactly looks. Uh, Levinson, as uh, another, as, as most of Russian architects, were from a uh, classicist school, so they uh, suggested classicist architecture. So the same thing we see from architect Parasnikov, that's something that reminds me also maybe Rome. Uh, Architect Tichurin, who was the main architect of Moscow, also took, took part in this competition. And what is maybe the most interesting of uh, most interesting part is this uh, uh, hillside and stairs to the Dnieper from Prashetik. So it's maybe the most monumental one with a lot of trees, stairs, uh, some. Uh, benches, uh, fountains, uh, sculptures, uh, columns, uh, and so on. So this was maybe the most the most ambitious way of solving this part of the city. And this is in Chichurin's project. Architect Sobolev, you can also see some Baroque. This is the city hall that uh, he suggested to be on the place of um, Hotel, Hotel Ukraine, that's on Maidan. Uh, architect Steinberg, the Brovovsky, and their group. Uh, this is their vision. They also wanted to see the city hall in that place. This is uh, their vision. Uh, by the way, you can see the statue there. Uh, most of those statues are Stalin statues. It was interesting that Stalin statue was not designed, it, it wasn't in the list of some uh, objects that are necessary, but most of architects understood that uh, they should suggest such stature because there was cult, cult of the leader, cult of the dictator, and that's why you need to see his statues on the central square. Um, the Gold Star, the um, project that had the first prize, uh, this you see here, uh, Maidan, where you see the Saint Sophia Cathedral, and you see some tower that is standing in the center. So in many projects, we had those towers. So they were like uh, city hall towers. Some of them uh, were proposed to be used as tourist objects, as observation decks and so on. But uh, they stood in the center of the square. Sometimes they stood not in the center of the square because the axes were calculated because Krushetik is not that straight street. It um, and, and that makes it more difficult to put uh, the, um, some high rise object that will dominate on the other square. And um, so that's why they are in different places. Uh, Project Cantata that is interesting not only by um, another location of some uh, war memorial, but the war memorial with the stage. It's interesting, but it is only also interesting by the road that we see as a highway uh, upon the stadium. That is, um, as I already told, one of the tasks was to uh, solve future traffic problems, and this is one of them. To make another street, to make some junction, to make some bridges uh, uh, that will take part of traffic to move this traffic out of Preshetic Street. And another the idea that they proposed is a multi-level junction. But as it is a Stalinist time, then uh, we uh, understand that each um, object should not only make uh, its function, but it should also uh, be beautiful, architecturally designed. Uh, so that's why these towers look uh, not just uh, uh, as something that holds up the bridge, but they look as some architectural objects. That's, that's the common practice of the time. So this was the idea that on Shevchenko Boulevard, we could have not only the boulevard, but uh, also the road that would cross uh, Prushatik um, as a bridge. 
the project Kiev was interesting uh, in the way that uh, this is maybe the only one project, the only project that uh, uh, had underground parkings under the square. So the green place on the left that you see is not just uh, a small park. Uh, under this park, uh, it was uh, suggested to have uh, uh, some underground uh, municipal park. An interesting thing. We uh, expect such um, decisions from 1990s uh, or early 21st century, but this was suggested even in 1944, such decision. Uh, so, uh, the tunnel, so uh, the ideas of tunnels uh, uh, to improve the traffic, the tunnel under the street. And uh, another project that's called in the name of Victory, that just suggested a big bridge upon the street. This idea was to connect the two regions, Lipki and uh, the higher city, the old city, uh, because there are two hills on the two sides of Krushchadik. And uh, each time when even now I need to go from one to another, I need to go up and uh, to go down and then go up. And when I go back, I go down and then I go up. The idea was to connect these parts of a uh, city with the bridge or Krushchadik. And this idea, um, uh, was uh, approved for the future development. Khrushchev liked this idea. So in 1946, when the second uh, part of competition took place, architect Vlasov, uh, as you see, is uh, building this road over Khrushchev with this bridge, uh, and um, he's designing it as some triumphal arc. So we need to make this bridge somehow look uh, not as a bridge upon the street, but as a triumphal arc. And uh, from other buildings you see are the uh, Victory Memorial, the hotel, the some residential buildings, city hall, theaters, and so on. So something that was designed here. And the project of architect Tetsi uh, that also has a bridge in the same place because this place was also chosen by Khrushchev and um, also many other buildings, uh, monuments, uh, and so on. So it's interesting that if we look at uh, this um, picture, because this picture was uh, found by me in uh, 2018, uh, I think that uh, it, it, it previously it was lost for many years. As you see, it was cut into different pieces, and it was like a puzzle that uh, was kept in library under different names. And it was not so easy to find it, but uh, when it was found, it was a great success because previously this uh, big uh, picture was considered to be lost. This picture is about two meters high, so uh, all these buildings are described in details, and it is very interesting to uh, see. And what's interesting is that uh, from here, if you know the buildings that are in Kiev now, you can understand that only few of them uh, were designed to survive. So all the city uh, was to be rebuilt and filled with ensembles, not only the street, but you see the quarters on the right and on the left, they're also um, uh, designed here. And it is not obligatory that this was the proposal, but this was the vision. And uh, the, we see the scale of this vision, we see that this is not only about one street. This is the whole city center that is designed to be uh, as a, a part of ancient Rome with uh, many buildings um, that are built instead of those that survived. Of course, this couldn't be done because, uh, as you know, as I previously told, that politics of architect Lasso were to, to keep everything that could be kept. Uh, only uh, except in those buildings uh, that are on the place where uh, it is expected to be some another thing, some road or some park on some another plans for this place. So um, this is why uh, some buildings that we saw before that were damaged, they were not rebuilt. They were dismantled in 1944 and 1945 to widen the street, uh, to have the boulevard that we have now, and uh, uh, this was 
the approach that is to use damage as some uh, ability for improvement. Uh, when I talked to some people that uh, were working on this dismantling of the buildings uh, in 1945, they told me that they were told that we will build a new street that will be better than the previous one. Now, uh, many people uh, don't uh, understand the value of the street that we have now, and they say that uh, we shouldn't have done that, we should have rebuilt old buildings, and I know that, of course, some of them had an historical and architectural value. But uh, unfortunately, fortunately, uh, we don't have them now. Now we have those buildings that were built in the 50s, and it depends from us how we keep them for the future. But the last thing that I want to say is about mass housing of 1940s. So what we had, we had 40% of uh, housing square that was destroyed because of war. And in 40s, a lot of buildings need to be built. But uh, what, uh, what is the situation? No cranes or machines are available because uh, uh, we, don't, we just don't have them. We have insufficient construction materials. and. Uh, the me uh, metal, concrete, and sometimes brick uh, are produced not in those amounts that are needed because everything is, uh, needs reconstruction, so we need to produce much more than we can produce. That's why we need to look for some alternative materials. In 1940s, cinder blocks that were made from you know, the waste of some uh, industrial objects were used. And that's why typical projects were designed to use those cinder blocks instead of uh, brick. It's also interesting that sometimes brick uh, was, uh, sometimes when we had no brick, uh, some projects were designed to use wood. But in Kiev we had brick and uh, wood, we had less wood, but more brick. That's why some wooden projects, I, I know one building in Kiev that is built from uh, brick, but the project uh, was designed to build it from wood. Also, we have projects that were designed to build from cinder blocks, but they were built also from brick. But in Kiev, we have some buildings, um, many buildings that were built from cinder blocks. So we have typical projects. This, those are low-rise buildings because we don't have cranes or machines available. So this all must be uh, hand work. And uh, as we don't have enough concrete or metal, we use cinder blocks. And this means that all this uh, construction will be low rise because no cranes, and we use some alternative materials that we are not sure that they are um, good enough for highest construction. But as it is a uh, period of Stalinist architecture, we have ensembles of quarters. So uh, we uh, have, um, how to say, a number of projects uh, that together can fill the quarter. So, uh, quarters were designed to look like ensembles. And uh, that's why typical projects have decorated facades, but there are many types of projects, uh, serious types of projects. Uh, so, some of them are designed for corners, some of them designed for central parts of quarters, some of them are designed for the second line. But the idea is you can take this number of projects from the series and build a quarter. That would, would be symmetrical, uh, that would look like an ensemble. Uh, and here you can see these uh, quarters around the city. They look like some regularly placed ensembles of small settlements. The most famous of them is the Avarini settlement on the left bank of Dnieper. Uh, here you can see not on a typical project, but uh, some specially designed them by architect Kolostenko. He made some special design of buildings and some of them were decorated even with Baroque style elements. Uh, and what is also the value that is not understood now that uh, this mass housing produced a human scale environment where we had two or three floors, where we had uh, a lot of trees, so these uh, areas were green. And now when this is lost, it's replaced by ugly 24 or 20 floor buildings that give us long shadows, overpopulation, and high traffic. So this is a completely different environment that happens. And I'll show some of these um, time projects. So we see there are two or three story buildings uh, that happen around the city, and usually they are surrounded with um, 
a lot of trees because this all was built as a single part. So the buildings were built and the trees were planted and the roads were built. So it was uh, mostly considered uh, to be like a big incentive sometimes. Uh, when um, the projects start from uh, number two, it means that they are designed to be two floors high, but some of them were built higher. So we see the building that build, is built uh, by project 12072, uh, that is, as you see uh, on the project, it, it has two floors, but here we see it has three floors. And uh, we have, um, sometimes we see those buildings higher than there in the project. Uh, one of the most popular that is um, seen in many places, and these projects can be seen not only in Kyiv, but in many other cities. Um, another one, uh, and uh, some of them are more decorated, some of them are less, uh, and the series 302 is a um, series designed by architect Dobrovolsky, um, that was the uh, main architect of Kiev for some time. And these uh, series also used some Baroque elements in their decoration. So they were very rich in some elements. And this was uh, the interesting part of the story because the series was very expensive and it was used only for a few years in late 40s and early 50s. And I've seen uh, such buildings in Kiev, in Mariupol, and I know that in Kremenchuk also there are buildings of this luxury series of the time. Oh, so I think uh, this is the story that I wanted to tell. Thank you, thank you, Suman. It was very detailed a lecture. Uh, I think everyone found something for for uh, for them and. Uh, my question, first question will be about our reality. And uh, in our reality, we have a lot of refugees which uh, uh, which are in different country and uh, uh, someone that uh, live in temporary housing and uh, how this problem uh, was solved in uh, Kyiv in after the World War II. Uh, about 40% of housing was lost and damaged uh, well, uh, where people were living. So, uh, as I already told, not only 40% of uh, housing square was lost, but uh, city lost 80% of population. So, there were not so many people that before the war. And people came back not, uh, not immediately. I knew some some people that I talked with. They came back in 1948, uh, in the end of 40s, sometimes even in 50s. So some of them continued to live in evacuation. Uh, but people who returned, they uh, mostly lived in those communal apartments. So communal apartments became the most widespread type of housing. As my family before the war, they had separate apartment. And when they came after the war, they lived for. I think uh, until 70s, they lived in a communal apartment. So it was um, more than 20 years uh, while the problem of housing was beginning to be solved. Some people lived in some very, I was to say, built, it's hard to say that it was a, a house, it was something that was digged in the land that we call Zemlyanka. Some people lived there. But the most uh, widespread were communal apartments. Some people lived in barracks, so in temporary buildings. So many barracks were built. They were built from uh, wood. Uh, some of them, uh, so they, some of them were considered to be temporary uh, housing. But at the same time, uh, the mass housing was not that mess that it um, happened uh, later when uh, there were cranes, machines, um, panels, and so on. This all was happening all, all, only in late 50s. In 40s, uh, it was a hard time because uh, uh, much of housing was damaged and uh, the construction uh, was going slowly. It was, it also, it was going slowly because industry, industry was uh, had higher priority than housing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, another question is how many years did uh, uh, to give everyone housing? Uh, how many years uh, did it take? Uh, for what? Uh, to give uh, every citizen uh, housing 
apartment. Uh, you know that uh, I say that I know some friends that live in communal apartments even now, so we cannot say that this problem is completely solved. But uh, the what's interesting that the lack of housing square was the reason why it was for many years it was very hard to uh, ruin some old building because it, because it was valuable as housing square. So, so that's uh, what preserved many old buildings from being destroyed until 80s. So I think it was about uh, early 80s when old buildings uh, or, or and late 70s when uh, this problem was considered to be solved enough for old buildings to be destroyed and for new ones to be built on their place. Mm -hmm. And another question is, uh, you say that uh, we, uh, that Vlasov uh, said that we must uh, every box which uh, were uh, in the after the war we must uh, rebuild. And uh, how many people uh, were involved in uh, this reconstruction? So it's I think maybe how uh, half part of. Uh, citizens my, uh, must uh, rebuild. I don't know the numbers and I don't think that anyone tried to take those numbers to calculate them. So I understand that many people um, were involved in uh, dismantling so they were used just to take the brick and to or uh, to use some simple instrument to bring something to the car or to the uh, to some place, so they were used not as professionals, but uh, when you build something, you need to have some knowledge about this. So how many professional builders were there? I don't know. And also don't know how many people worked there just because they needed to do it, they needed to build something, because sometimes it happened then when some factory is building a house uh, for its workers, those people go and just build it by their hands to make it quick, to make it um, it was um, it was uh, a practice of the time also, but I don't know the numbers and I don't know if anyone knows those numbers. I think no one calculated them ever. Uh -huh. OK, and uh, my another question is about. Uh, I heard uh, the lecture about that, that if you want to attract people to destroy uh, uh, destroy city, you must uh, give them labor market. And uh, what was the um, point of uh, Soviet government? Uh, housing, infrastructure and uh, jobs. What was the um, pri priority of these three points? As I previously told, that the, the priority was the industry that was ruined during the war. So first of all, we needed to rebuild the industry. Then people will have a place to work. But those people need to have a place to live. But uh, for the first time, these were dormitories, barracks. I don't know, this was not a convenient place to live. And infrastructure, of course, uh, we needed some infrastructure. We needed to have the railway station. We needed to have some critical infrastructure that needs for city to um, to live. Well, of course, those people needed some place to have food. So. Uh, some containers were also built at each factory. So this is uh, what the most critical ones that we needed. Uh, always uh, in Soviet times, um, such uh, infrastructure as theater, cinemas usually was built later than uh, the residential ones because the, the first is uh, something critical for work. It's uh, industry and so on. Then people need some place to live, and then when they have some place to live. Uh, they later they can have some cinema or a theater or some sport complex and so on. So that's why many of the uh, places that were uh, built uh, later in Soviet time, uh, some of them don't have uh, uh, some infrastructure built in Soviet time even now. That's why. Okay, and. Uh, another question is uh, is about uh, I talk uh, with you 
a few days ago, and you say that you have interest in a case of Zaporizhia, of a plant of big trees. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, do you have uh, something to show us or, oh. or, te or tell us uh, about this uh, interest? I can tell because, because it's uh, very ecological. It's interesting that, uh, uh, as I told, that uh, Kiev is green as a result of big work. And this work was done not only here. It was a policy, state policy, that a state had some urban policy. And this idea was that every city must be green. And we need to have a lot of trees planted in some areas where we build new buildings. Especially it was um, focused in 40s and 50s. And the case of Zaporizhia was that when a transformator plant um, uh, created its uh, living district, some massive of, of the same two, three story buildings of typical projects, but they had some interesting improvements. Because, first of all, they uh, designed wear roads. Later, they brought all the communications uh, during, not after constructing the buildings, but uh, in the same time. So, water and uh, sewer system, electricity, this all uh, was brought to the place because uh, everything was planned where each building will be. And at the same time, it was interesting that some trees were planted, but not in the place where the buildings will be. But they were planted some um, in some greeneries, uh, so in some places uh, where small trees were planted. And uh, in a few years, uh, where buildings uh, were complete, and when this uh, when inhabitants came into their buildings, the trees were planted, but they were planted not as small ones. They were planted as trees uh, that are four or six years old, and uh, they were planted with some special equipment with cranes because they are heavy. But this was very important because um, we need trees in residential areas because they bring us shadow, and they and this is very important now. This became even more important now because we have those climatic changes, and now. Uh, the temperature uh, is going higher. That's why it's more important to have trees than it was before. And the idea is that the more trees you have, the faster they get um, long shadow, uh, the lower will be the temperature of uh, the place around those trees. So I, I think that this case is very useful. I see that sometimes this is used even now, but uh, it is not widely used because most of times I see when some old tree is cut down, instead of it, we get some very thin tree that is usually dying in a few years. But the case of Zaporizhia is a good case because when we uh, plant uh, some tree that is, has uh, four or six years old, uh, we uh, make it faster to have shadow that would be good for inhabitants. So this place would sooner become more um, comfort to live. And I think that it can be used easily. I see that sometimes it is used now, but it's more expensive to plant some grown trees. It must be some, uh, it's, uh, it's, it must the uh, government uh, do it, yes? I, I'm not sure that many people in the government know that uh, this case exists and this can be done. The problem is that uh, I was surprised to know about it and uh, I want more people to know about it. So, thank you for this uh, case. And uh, another question is in modern architecture time, uh, some of architects like Corbusier and another famous architects, uh, they uh, they didn't like a street in classic way. So when you have a building from the uh, both sides and the road uh, in the middle, and they wanted uh, to build some building uh, really in the plot and uh, with a, a lot of greenery and it uh, destroy uh, the classic street. Uh, so, uh, what uh, was uh, this uh, built uh, in this way in Kiev? Oh, well, 
many of the well we need to remember that we had 1955 that was a turning point of architecture because at that time uh, the decorated architecture was told to be bad because we need to uh, build something cheaper and we need to build some modern buildings but the main idea was economy if we don't use the decorations so we can uh, uh, spend this money on construction so this was an idea that totally changed the architecture because it is it was impossible uh, to change this policy without uh, uh, destroying all the mm, uh, all, all this approach that was um, used for two decades of Stalinist architecture. But later we got this modernist era and uh, this modernist era told that uh, we don't need any more of this, those ensembles. We don't need the avenues to be built uh, line by line. So we don't need those uh, structures that uh, previously uh, were used. And this gives us new abilities. So this is ability, th these are the abilities to make um, uh, residential areas greener because buildings can be built far from the road and uh, they can have more trees before building between building and the street so this also can be useful uh, and uh, also we are not uh, obliged to um, make some um, ensemble so for example if in Stalinist time we have an avenue going from west to east uh, on the southern side, we will have some buildings, and on the northern also, that will have facades facing north. Uh, when the facade is facing north, it is uh, considered that it is bad because there is low sunlight in the apartment. So in Stalinist times, they tried to play uh, to use um, uh, uh, stairs uh, to be on the northern side to use kitchens to be on the northern side, so they played with the inner structure. But when we are not obliged to use the, to build building uh, along the avenue, we can uh, place it anywhere we want and uh, we can use it to, to make better sunlight, make better insulation inside of the building. So uh, this change gave new abilities. And there are many regions with this, so most of uh, modernist uh, uh, massives that were built in Kiev, almost every of them is uh, has uh, this uh, practice. Many, of them, not all of them, but many of them have. Maybe the best example is the uh, northern uh, Brovarsky, former Komsomolsky um, massive that uh, uh, has a lot of experimental projects, approaches, and so on. So the buildings that were built in early 60s, they all have the same uh, orientation in space. So it's very interesting that uh, most of them don't have apartments facing north, and it was the how it was in this time. And uh, also in most of them, we see this approach because this was uh, a rule that uh, uh, there should be no apartments facing only north because it is bad for your health. Something like that. Thank you for this detailed answer. And another question is about uh, 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 industry building, uh, housing building uh, gave a lot of apartment uh, to people and it's very big advantage. But in the in the at the same time, they are the same. So uh, a lot of blocks, a lot of uh, areas uh, built uh, with uh, with ordinary uh, uh, ordinary house. And uh, what is the uh, advantage? At what what is the uh, negative of this? Uh, of this industrial housing and how we uh, give uh, the best uh, from them and avoiding the negative in our reconstruction, which will will take in few years, I think. Uh, so 
the advantages are clear that we can build a lot of them and we can build them fast. When I was writing books about Kiev, I tried to calculate the number of buildings that were built each year and the highest rate was uh, was in 60s when the uh, Bolshevikov was built sometimes there were more than 40 buildings each year and it is a very big number it's only one region Kiev, only one place of Kiev and I calculated 40 buildings a year and this is a lot and this means that type of projects that are simplified that are standardized and that uh, uh, use uh, everything standardized and when we have grains, when we have standardized process and when everything is built in the same place, you can have a lot of buildings built very fast. So this is the solution to the problem. Uh, and as you said, everything looks the same, but this was the problem that architects understood. That's why they tried to make um, those places have some face. So some of buildings were decorated with mosaics. This is a famous thing that the mosaics uh, that now uh, are disappearing, but people try to protect them. But we still don't know the history of our art because there are many, many objects that were created at that time. And uh, we don't have even the full list of them because nobody was trying to <laughs> analyze it. So only um, I think uh, in the last decade, we have some uh, researchers and books about those mosaics. So some uh, art in public spaces. Compositions. So uh, when we have uh, five story buildings around, sometimes we can place a nine story building that would make some kind of composition. This uh, was in many places. We had the uh, project uh, that was called a box uh, of nine story building and it was used in uh, um, those places where we had five story buildings. So it was an accent, a vertical accent, the tower there. So sometimes this also was used. Uh, some specific design of um, infrastructure buildings. So some theaters, some, uh, most of them also were built by typical projects, but uh, they all created some composition and some buildings were higher, some were lower, and so on. So uh, the best uh, approach when we had uh, those playing with compositions was in Traeshina, where uh, you can see that many buildings have different number of floors going up or going down, and buildings have the different color. And uh, in some micro districts, you have blue buildings, in other you have yellow buildings, in third you have um, red buildings, or you have brown buildings. So this makes some unique face for each place. Uh, so this was one of the problems, and this is the way that it was solved. Of course, what can we use from this? I think that, uh, of course, the massive uh, construction will be needed, but the problem is that uh, it needs to be planned in advance. So uh, because uh, in, I think, in the last maybe 10 or 15 years, the massive housing is not constructed anymore as it was in Soviet times. So uh, individual projects are used instead of typical projects. And so there is less standardization there. And uh, for massive construction, we need to have some standardization because we need a lot, a lot of panels, the same panels, typical projects, and a lot of the same buildings to be built up everywhere. And we, we understand that a lot of those buildings will be needed. So this is the question to the industry. So how this can be produced now and how can we avoid them looking the same, the same ways as uh, they before art, color, compositions and so on. But uh, to do this, there must be some centralized planning of this. So there must be some master plans of cities of their development. If this all is given uh, to chaotic process, we won't have uh, it that good. We will have some chaotic, chaotically built cities if uh, if this happens. Because I'm not sure that uh, the market economy cannot uh, have so much money spent on construction if it's a privately owned building. So the, another problem is private against state owned. In Soviet times, everything was state-owned, so state gave a lot of money for construction, and uh, but people didn't own this property. They just lived there, 
but now people own the property where they live. So uh, it's a question whose money will be spent there. Uh, so I think that it's also time for uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, whose property will be this one. Because people have lost their private property, yes, but state builds new pro uh, new property. Will it be state property, state owned property, or will it be the um, private property of those people who lost their property? This is the question. And uh, also it depends on how this process will happen. So I, I understand that there are many questions and uh, I don't always know the solution for them. How can this be organized? Because mass housing construction is uh, a very uh, complicated process because we need a lot of uh, factories to produce building materials, a lot of people who know what to do, a lot of engineers, a lot of uh, project organizations. And uh, for latest years, this all was degraded. So the um, the problem is that uh, we need to look at this experience to be used uh, now. And how do we want our cities to look? Do we want them to look chaotic? Or we can improve them, or we can make them beautiful, or make, we can make them greener. Uh, so we need to think about what future do what we want and how can we improve those cities. Uh, so this is another thing that I was telling today, that sometimes damage can be used as a chance to improve, but you need to think how we can improve. Yes, totally agree. and. Uh... Uh, I may say that uh, if we want to rebuild, uh, we must uh, to know uh, our uh, negative uh, experience. And uh, for, in my opinion, uh, uh, the negative experience which we have in our city is uh, infrastructure. So a lot of uh, has uh, cars and uh, public transport uh, must uh, must to develop in the city, and uh, what is uh, what else uh, we can uh, we should avoid in our reconstruction? Uh, you know, there's an, another interesting problem that uh, now uh, uh, first of all that uh, the missing infrastructure sometimes was built automatically by uh, capitalism, uh, supermarkets, sometimes even cinemas. So. People understand that there are many people living somewhere, for example, in Pozniki, and that those people need some cinemas, they need some supermarkets. So uh, if a centralized government planning system didn't uh, do it, uh, capitalism does it by himself because this is the money. Uh, and so this is the adventure that we have now. So that market economy uh, solves some problems like that. But as you said, people have cars and they have no place for those cars to be. So, and this is the problem because at Soviet time it wasn't to consider that all people will have cars and that people will have their cars uh, uh, staying under their house. So the problem of underground parkings, uh, this is the problem of traffic at all because uh, cities uh, don't have that good enough transport system. Uh, I remember that uh, I read that in the eight of eighties, uh, Kiev had such a big amount of trams that uh, we had about eighty trams crossing the river each hour. So there's more than one tram uh, in a minute. Now we don't have trams crossing the river, so our transport system also changed because uh, people are using cars, but they're using cars because they don't have uh, good enough transport. But the more they're using cars, the worse the transport is working because they use the same roads. So this is a problem that uh, there must be some policy. There must be some policy of public transport that uh, the first of all, that we, need, we need to develop public transport and then less people will use cars and there will be less traffic jams. So, but this, is, this must be this, the city policy, how we do it. And if we speak also about some uh, negatives, uh, uh, we must understand that the negative that was uh, seen now is that this mass construction isn't stable against war. 
uh, that uh, panel buildings are easy to ruin uh, just uh, by hitting the building somewhere in, in the bottom. But the problem is that many people say now that we need to have those buildings protected, to have some secure place uh, against uh, the war, but this will make those buildings more expensive. So on one side we have uh, economy, uh, the price and the ability to build a lot, and on the other hand, we have their uh, security and um, the ability to uh, uh, not to be ruined after some damage. So the strength of the building is not is on the opposite side of the uh, economy. So this is the problem. So if, if we have panel buildings, they are easily to be destroyed. Yes, but. Uh, these are the opposite problems. Was it, what is the most important for us? Security or the speed that we can rebuild the cities? Uh, this is the question, and uh, I don't know the right answer. Yeah, it will be. It will be uh, really not uh, not simple answer. And uh, we uh, in architecture history, we have interesting example of uh, plan of Ser de Barcelona in uh, 1867, uh, uh, when, uh, when they have uh, the strategy that uh, they know that uh, that will uh, that will will have the streets and they give uh, people uh, the chance to build something that they want, but it uh, will be in the street which will be uh, which will be built. So uh, maybe uh, maybe this strategy is uh, this will be work for us. This strategy is good if it works. So the problem is uh, we have two problems. Uh, one one of them is corruption and. <laughs> Is the main problem, and another is uh, that uh, people that break the rules are not punished. So my question is, if we let people build what they want by following the rules of some number of floors, of some other rules, maybe of exterior, that it shouldn't be that ugly, that uh, it should be following some kinds of rules. Uh, the problem is what to do with those who break those rules, to do what they want. And this is important because uh, if we don't have that control and if we don't have that mechanism of punishment, we will have uh, ugly, chaotically built cities uh, if nobody is punished for breaking those rules. So this is important and this is uh, what uh, what I think first when I hear about that people can build what they want. Of course, it's good because uh, when there's some private initiative, people are pressed to do because they do it for themselves and uh, uh, the state has less problems, but the state has also need to understand how many people will help many buildings, how many people will live there, so they could calculate how much water will be needed, how much electricity will be needed there. So urban development cannot be done um, without communicating with a city, with some central uh, administration, because this is not only a question of some square meters that people have. It's also a question of traffic. It's also a question of uh, some other services of electricity, of water, as I said. So this this is not done by themselves. This is done by some special services, and they need to understand how the city will be developed. And uh, these are the questions. Mm -hmm. And will be the last uh, question is uh, 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 who uh, will be held uh, the responsibility for them central government or local uh, local government so uh, who uh, must say that we build uh, we build in this way and like you say the law are uh, the law are uh, and uh, we will punish uh, someone uh, who uh, don't uh, don't use law. Uh, uh, you know, each of these decisions has its uh, problems because I see when the uh, when we talk about some uh, central government, I understand that central government will not will not be able to see uh, everything.
every city and every place and to check out everything by themselves. If we speak about local government, then we hire change of some corruption there. But I think the corruption is possible everywhere. But the main problem is that how to make uh, people follow the rules and how to make those uh, rules. Uh, the one problem is how to make correct rules and another even other problem is how to make people follow those rules. Because I don't know where it will be harder. I understand that some local decisions should be made by some local uh, administrations. But the, the whole strategy and the rules, I think they must be developed by central government because uh, uh, there must be some control because a lot of money will be given by uh, some European states, as we know. So they would like to know how this money is spent. So we will need to have some control over this process. Um, and uh, this is the question for all uh, global strategies that are in Ukraine. So how to make people follow the rules and what to do with corruption. So so um, so let's end on the some uh, positive side. Uh, so um, please uh, uh, say some three uh, some three um, lessons from uh, from the case of Kiev reconstruction, which we must uh, to to do in our rebuilds of Ukraine. Okay, three lessons. The first lesson is that uh, most damaged buildings can be rebuilt. This is important because we need to preserve the heritage. The first lesson is sometimes damage can be considered as a chance to improve. So we must think how can we make better than it was before. And the third lesson is that when we make mass construction, it can be human scaled. It we shouldn't be uh, always building some 24 buildings, 24 floor buildings. We can really uh, make uh, some regions with two or three four floor buildings that will be a human scaled environment, green and so on. So this is the third lesson that we have that architecture can be uh, simple but beautiful and human scaled and uh, green and uh, now we even more understand uh, how it is important for us. So I hope that those lessons will be learned and uh, heard by other people and maybe some of this experience of our case after the Second World War will be used uh, after we finish this war. So thank you, Simon. Thank you for this okay. interesting evening. So, so I think it's all. So goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone who was with, who were with us. So goodbye.